Okay, welcome lovely listeners. Um, today it is a real privilege for me. I love this woman. Um, Claire Powell, Taylor Powell. Cool, oh, crikey, I nearly forgot your surname then. So Claire um, has been my acupuncturist for 10 years, as we've just discovered. I was just working it out. And Claire was the main reason, well, yeah, she was. She was the reason why my life changed. I was in a marriage that I shouldn't have been in. And when I met Claire and we had some acupuncture sessions, so Claire's an acupuncturist amongst many other things that she does. And um, it was the realization with a session with Claire that almost had me hit over the head with a sledgehammer, that's how it felt at the time, um, that I was living a lie. And from that moment on, it wasn't an easy journey. There was lots of tears and there was lots of denial by me, um, but I finally got there. Um, but she's changed my life, or we've changed my life um, forever. And uh, I will be forever grateful to this lady. And she has a very special place in my heart. So I would like to welcome the lovely Claire. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Mel. <laughs> it's a joy to be here with you today, the day after my birthday, which seems yeah. very, very auspicious. Yes. And we've met up again. It's been a while with lockdown and all of that. Oh, it's been, yeah, I know, because I was coming to you just before um, yeah. and I had a cold, so I That's stayed it. away. That's it. And then we had lockdown. So I, I really do want a session at some point, Claire. So, um, we'll get we'll uh, get so yeah, so Claire, I mean, I'm so excited to have you on because you are such uh, an inspiration to me. You're such uh, a tonic, so different than most people that I know. And, um, you know, really, I feel. <clears throat> excuse me, that this podcast has been a result of, you know, that pivotal day back in 2010, where I took the, the leap of faith that was changing my life and not settling anymore for second best. So yes, I've got you to, th I've got, oh, I've just had tr truth bumps all over my body then. <laughs> um so yeah so you're responsible for the podcast Claire <laughs> Bless you. well yes I'm pleased to be part of it very yeah. pleased to be part of it yes so yeah so so happy to have you on and um because you know I, I would just love you to share some of your story really and some of your slightly wacky wisdom that I love um and you know I think, I think you've been instrumental in changing lots of people's lives. The, the people that want to change their life, the people that are ready to change their lives, you're cer you certainly know how to guide them into that different space. Um, but what about, what about your story? Because you used to be in the RAF a long time ago. Yes, Mel, I, <laughs> you know, and I was thinking about this on the, on the dog walk this morning, because as you know, I can go on a bit. I mean, you know, <laughs> this, this podcast could take three months and I'd still be here talking probably to myself. You've gone off, you've gone <laughs> travel the world by then. I'm still going off. So I was trying to look at how, how could I sort of, you know, bring this, crystallize it down into a few key points um, so as not to bore your, your viewers and listeners too much. And what it came, it came to me that we start off our journey, I think, from observation, from my own personal perspective, the majority of humans start off their journey on Earth. And we'll just remind ourselves, my belief is that we are souls, divine souls, incarnating in human form. And it's the hardest part of our soul development journey that there is. I think you know, if anyone's laughing at us, the gods up there, they're saying, oh, you picked the you know, lucky dip. Oh, unlucky, you got Earth. Um, <laughs> And actually, there are days when I feel that way. And there are days when, like yesterday, when I was eating a lot of coffee and walnut cake. Yeah. And I thought, you know, it's great to be human. It's great <laughs> to be human. Um, I think the curry was it was a little a little step too far yesterday. But you know what? I pressed on and um, <laughs> probably regretting it. Today, but it was lovely in the moment. So I feel that most of us humans explore firstly as we come into this world. We forget, as part of the soul contract, we forget that we're souls, that we're divine light, and we just think that we are flesh and bone. You know, this is all I am. And we spend a, a, a variety amount of time, various amount of time, exploring what it's like to be a human and limited as a human. Mm. And we tend to be controlled by our egoic self. And I think there are two egos in play as a human. I think there's the ego that allows us to differentiate it allows me to differentiate myself from you and from the chair and the screen and the dog. So that's a positive 
way of separation, which is very interesting for a soul to experience that because as you know, the soul sense is that we are part of all that is. You know, there is just one unifying consciousness manifesting or otherwise non-manifesting and maybe previous incarnations on different planets, different uh, multidimensional realms, we've experienced a degree of separation, but I do believe the most A-level experience for a soul is to come to earth and experience in our mindset, total separation, total duality, polarity. So when we come in, we're operating from a place of fear. The, 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 the other ego, the hum, human egoic self operates from a place of survival, primal instinctual survival. And that is generally based on fear, fight or flight, freeze, fight, flight. So you and I have talked at length over the, over the decade. My God, you're looking good, my love. You're looking good. <laughs> um, we've talked a lot about that, the, the behavior that comes from a fear-based um, vibration, where we, and this is so apt for your podcast theme, where we stick with something because actually how many times have we heard ourselves say, better the devil you know than nothing at all. Mm. That sense of, of, of being lonely, you know, singular, isolated, rejected, abandoned. Actually, we'd, we'll go through anything to avoid that. And we'll stay and cling to something, even though it's injurious, even though it's, it's self-sabotaging and damaging. Hey, at least we know it. We can develop strategies to deal with that rubbish. Um, and then I believe having, and, and I'll put my hand up, it took me 42 years to get to that point when I suddenly decided, I would say there was a pivot point in my life based on a number of very extreme events that happened very, very close together. But it shocked me out of that almost sleepwalking state of this is how I live life as a human. And it was ugly. You know it as well as I've, I've shared it with you self-sabotage, low self-worth to no self-worth, um, controlling, manipulative, fear-based. You know, I explored the entire spectrum of human emotion and behavior at, at that end, shall we say. Yeah. And then I got to this point, 42, and I thought, you know, enough. I, I've actually hit the buffers now. I can't face living my life like this. And I am a slow learner, and I hold my hand up to that. And I wonder, looking back, might I have learned that lesson a little quicker? But I've made it sprung at the age of 26 into this lovely, happy state. But I actually believe everything I went through was for a reason. To get me to the place where I am now that gives me the confidence and the courage to pursue a path of authenticity. Mm. And, you know, we make choices. You know, we're not victims anymore. That was naught to 42. I was the victim, the martyr role. Now I stand on my own two feet, I make choices, and I know what the consequences are of those choices. And I'm happy to take them, because I know that to do anything else is not authentic, is not aligned with my highest good. And what would be the point? Because I've spent 42 years perfecting being anything but authentic. So, you know, it's, as you say, it can still be a rocky road. We can still have some little um, upsets along the way. But ultimately, I feel the path, what I would call the path home, home to me, as I remember myself to be this soul incarnating in human form, something so much bigger than flesh and bone. Um, now I start to expand my conscious awareness and I can see the limitless possibilities of having the most fabulous life on earth. In the old days, you and I would have had to sit on the mountain for 35 years, meditating, just breathing air, you know, to be the wise sage. And then we would become enlightened as we died. You'd have to leave the planet physically yeah. to be enlightened and to reach that ecstatic state of, of connection with all this is. And now we can do it now. We can do it on this earth as a human. And that's the astonishing evolutionary change in our soul growth. So that's why I think I'm here, having done what I've done and been through what I've been through um, and being very happy that I've you know, made that journey. And I don't think I, sh I could have shortcut it, short circuited it with, and still get to where I am now because all of those experiences are valid. 
Yeah. And you and I could be weeping in yet another glass of wine about, you know, yet another disaster, yeah. romantically or career choice or whatever. But actually, that experience helps us to make more informed choices next time. So we don't have to keep repeating the same old, same old. Sometimes we do. But actually, as we get older and wiser, we don't have to keep stepping onto that hamster wheel of fate. We can make choices and we can take different directions. Mm. And I think the confidence that you get when you step out alone and you say, OK, I'm going for this. I'm not going to muddle around anymore. I'm not going to you know, fiddle around the edges while Rome burns. I'm actually going to go for this all in. The, the delight, the payback, the reward is astonishing. More than we could ever have believed possible when we were playing the victim and doing the martyr thing for, for however long we did it at the first part of our journey. Would so, you, yeah. Sorry, I was going to say, would, would you share what you said 42 was was your time to change? Yeah. Was there a particular thing that, that created that? Yes, it was. I think what happened was I'd reached the, the, the zenith of my inauthentic life. So everything that I'd been doing came to a wonderful crescendo. So the third, no, actually the second meaningful relationship came to an end. Um, and in fact, it was three days of hell. And I'll share that. Um, my mum suffered a stroke unexpectedly. She was quite well in many ways, little health impairments, but actually generally well in the, in the heart department and the mind. She suffered a massive stroke, lost consciousness and died three days later. I was in the funeral parlor. My, my, there were some family catas catastrophic events around my, my siblings, which I won't share, it's private, but they were going through their own long, dark night of the soul. And it was all, um, the, the catalyst was mum dying. Yeah. I was in the funeral parlor on my own because my brother and sister had to go off and attend to family disasters. And my boy, I rang my boyfriend and said, I'll be home soon. I'm just choosing what mother's going to wear in the coffin, you know, great, yeah, yeah. Uh, on my own. And uh, he said, well, I'm not coming home. I'm sorry. He said, I'm not coming home. So 12 years of a relationship, which had been stuttling, stu stuttering for two, we should have left it up after 10, but I always overstay my welcome. His um, timing was pants. So that timing, no, timing was great because well, it had to be, you know what, Mel, and you and I have spoken about this. If something is broken and you spent years fixing it and you've been gluing it together and putting the sticky tape over and putting your head in the sand and pretending it's all okay really and then it's not and then I can struggle through. My, my personal experience is if something is so woefully broken but you haven't got the strength to actually put it down as it should be done, um, someone has to behave in such a way that is so utterly intolerable that they give you the courage to say enough now. I, that I can't accept. So him leaving me while I was in the funeral parlour was was sufficiently awful for me to say, okay, it's done. Because I'd spent two years trying to say that to him and he'd spent two years trying to say that to me. Right. And, we, and, we, and we just kept coming back to the same, we don't know how else to be. We, we don't know who else we are. If it's not this, what is it? Hmm. So we hung on in there. But that was sufficiently awful and brutal that I then had the courage to say it's done. He knew that, but at least one of us had to say it. So I was able to say it. Um, so the, it was a shocking three days. And the beauty of it all was, I've been told by many mediums that my mum was always going to go at that time. Hmm. And that she was deeply saddened by the, the shock waves that her passing <laughs> set out. But actually it was, a, it was the most perfect catalytic energy for us all, all my siblings and myself to all look at our lives and go, Jesus, this is all nuts. It's all, it's all rubbish. And we all made drastic personal domestic changes in the moment, pretty much. Nice. So it was an extraordinary time. Um, and I never looked back. I had three years in the wilderness. I remember having a, a, a reading <laughs> with a, with a Oh God, a tarot reading on holiday with my girlfriend because she was recently single. I was very single and partly bereaved uh, with mum passing. Dad was still with me. Um, and we went to holiday to, to lick our wounds, if you like, and we had a reading and hers was quite good. And the lady looked at my cards and she said, well, you've got three years in the wilderness. Well, thanks very much. Yeah, right. I really needed to hear that. Sorry, that's my clock going off. 
Um, and do you know, I did have three years in the wilderness. I had the void. Um, and it was a strange place to be. It was, I'll just wait for the clock to finish. <laughs> the RSPB clock strikes, the, the owl strikes. At oh, it's an owl, is it? I couldn't an owl, it. yes, it's oh. an owl. Um, so I, I knew I didn't want to go back to being that person. She, she was done. She was just a mess. It was just tortuous to be her, to be honest. And I'd flog that one to death. So, but I didn't know who I was. That was the strange thing. I'd spent so long being who I wasn't, but it sort of was me, but it was the part of me that was done. Mm. It was the egoic self that was going from fear. But I didn't yet have a concept of who I was because you know, I just hadn't really been her probably since the age of five. It was probably the last time I'd been remotely me. Um, so it took three years of floundering around. I did internet dating, disaster after disaster. <laughs> um, my friends loved that three years because they were <laughs> royally entertained by the disaster. Comes up over dinner many times. Many times. Um, but again, each time the, the chap I dated was a mirror of where I was. So over three years, the men became less mad and less dysfunctional um, and, and more normal because I was getting to that place. And then I just started to, to reach out. And the first course I did was neuro linguistic programming, um, an NLP practitioner and teacher course and, and coaching course. And that was the beginning of this. Literally, I turned around and started heading for home. And then I discovered acupuncture. I was having treatment and thought, I want to do this for a living. I discovered, uh, discovered color mirrors, um, sound healing, started to develop my channeling skills using oracle cards and just. To, effectively just working with energy being much more open and receptive and tuned into energy never look back yeah never look back and the last internet date i had well we've just clocked up 13 years ah, <laughs> <laughs> and he's my twin flame without a shadow of a doubt um you know he was always there waiting for me he's moved in now, moved in moved yeah. in in november yeah how's it been yeah fantastic can you imagine? He moved in in November. He kept working as a consultant till March, two days before the lockdown. So I never saw him pretty much. He was out um, doing all sorts of stuff, work stuff. And then he moved in. I had COVID and I said, don't come home. Um, and he said, oh, rubbish to that. I'll be fine. Right. Uh, and he does have a strong constitution. So I was sort of day five of COVID and he just moved in. And then that was it, the lockdown. And we've spent longer together in lockdown than we had in 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I thought, well, if that's going to be a test, yeah. And it was lovely. We got on. We just, just, it's like we've been together forever. Aww. I know. Wonderful. I know. Worth waiting for. Worth waiting for. Worth, worth journeying for. Yeah. Truth. Um, but I was also thinking about, you know, is this free will? Is this fate? Is it destiny? And it occurred to me that I had my astrological birth chart done by an astrologer called Pam Gregory, who I absolutely rate. She lives in the New Forest, beautiful lady, met her a number of times on, on workshops. And about three years ago, she drew up my chart for me. And it absolutely had to the day, the RAF experience. So I had a strong militaristic theme, um, which I know I've had in past lives. So the, the first part of my, my incarnation was you know, joining the Air Force, air traffic controller and, and all sorts, was absolutely where I should have been. And then it was at 42 on the bloody astrological chart, apologies for the swear word. Um, that was my pivot point. That was my, you know, literally return home point. Couldn't believe it. And then it became deeply mystical. I've got Mercury, Neptune, um, the sun. I've got all sorts of wondrous sort of planetary arrangements for this second part of my life. That absolutely fit what I'm doing. So I orchestrate. I and what it it occurred to me for the first time today, actually, Mel, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to review my thoughts and clear my thinking. I've often wondered how does astrology and the soul contract work together? Mm. Are they a lucky coincidence? Are they you know two things that work sort of dynamically but but came from different vibrations? And I thought, actually, from my perspective, I wrote my soul contract sitting, looking at my birth chart. So if I incarnate on July 3rd, and I think it was uh, 15, 11 hours the afternoon, um, 
this is my planetary arrangement so this is going to support me in exploring life to the full in this way so it, you know if i wanted to start off with the human ego self and look at individuation as uh, polarity separation and fear brilliant go and be in the military <laughs> it's absolutely perfect it's absolutely perfect um you know be that warrior energy from a place of of, of sort of you know individuality and then if you want to leave that behind because you've you've explored it and you've you've, you've um nailed it shall we say then let's look at the other side so i've done the human side really the whole gamut of human activity i've bloody done it been there seen it and the t-shirt and then if you want to do the spiritual self great let's let's look at the astrological um alignments and the potentials and you know if you want to do it clary it's all there for you go do it and that's what i've done without even knowing i might add yeah. because i only had the birth chart done three years ago and i started to study acupuncture in 20 uh, 2007 what drew you to acupuncture how did you how did that transition happen so after my my three years of, of nightmarish uh, yeah. times i was having acupuncture i moved house so my boyfriend and i split up it was his house so i had to move out i bought a house around the corner and i was still in uniform I was still in the air force in those days so i was coming home from work one day and my neighbor but one little terry little wave to terry mm -hmm. um she knocked my door and she said oh i noticed you're in uniform you just moved in how are you doing and she took one look at my face and she said well you need a drink <laughs> <laughs> a very insightful woman that girl so i was round hers two bottles of wine later and my whole life story came out the tragedy of it and she said you need some acupuncture and I actually remember saying to her, what's that? Mm. There was a day I didn't know what acupuncture was. <laughs> it's a strange time, isn't it? You can actually you know, draw a line in the sand before acupuncture, after acupuncture, before COVID, after COVID, yeah. um, BCAC. But um, so I, I started having treatment with a very, very magical lady. She had one foot in this dimension and one foot in the fifth dimension, no doubt about it. She said, I have a spirit guide. He's a Native American Indian who works with me. And this is how unaware I was. This is the world I've been living in. And I said, oh, where is he? And she said, he's standing over there. And I went, well, I can't see him. I thought it was real. I thought she was talking about a real Native American Indian. He was just going <laughs> into the treatment room. She said, he's a spirit guide. And I said, what's that? Anyway, I had a lot of catching up to do, Mel. Good. But she... It was such a magical experience. She brought me out of the black hole, the real, oh, I bounced on the bottom of that black pit of despair many a time. But she gave me the tools to, you know, to start to find my way out. Um, and you know, I've always maintained, I don't heal anybody. I just reawaken the ability to heal yourself in my, in my patients. Remind them, you know, you and I talked at length about our authenticity and, and trying to find that truth. And if we're not living the truth, what would we do about it? And it's not that I showed you where to go. You already knew all of this. Yeah. It's just we have an amazing ability to batten down the truth if the truth looks threatening. Mm. And any change is threatening when we're in a bad place because we're only just hanging on to that bloody place. You know, to, to try and put another dynamic in just feels horrendous. So we'll, we'll just go for the status quo, thanks. Um, so all I feel I do is just act as that catalytic energy for someone to reawaken to their own truth, their own healing capacity, their own multidimensional awesomeness. Mm. And once they step into that, woof, they're away. They're away. And that's what this lady did for me. And mm. I never look back. So you had your treatment. Obviously, you had probably had more than one with her. Oh, God, I had years. And then, yeah. so did you, did you think... I want to do this straight away or was it a bit of a process process because at the time when i went to see her i was in such a mess i really was i was functioning i was a functioning catastrophe uh, but it wasn't pretty i was just getting through each day to be honest so she needed to do some work to just help my energy to to recover its equilibrium to you know it's like if, if you've got a flood plain you're not going to start sowing seeds for the next harvest until you've drained it You've dug your drainage ditches, you've cleared them all out, you've prepared the soil, and only then can you start to actually plant the seeds for the new growth. Yeah. So there's a bit of, there's quite a bit of sort of mending and putting back together 
um, before we, I feel that we can actually launch into the, into who we are, who yeah. we really are. Uh, we've got to have quite a firm foundation in order to take that leap of faith. Otherwise, the minute it gets tough, we'll just fall back into the old, into the old ways, the old habituated responses. Because that's what served us. Um, and, and the pullback can be very compelling, as we know. Better the devil you know. So, yeah, a bit of mending. I think about 18 months of mending and healing. And then I was just lying on the couch and I already knew I was going to give in my notice to the Air Force. I had to give a year's notice. And I thought, I'm going to have to earn a, a living. Because, wow. Yeah. I used to, uh, it, on some branches, it's 18 months. You have wow. to plan ahead. Mm. It's quite good because you can really prepare then, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and I was just lying on the couch, you know, sometime about, a, I think, a year um, before I left the Air Force. And I thought, oh, my God, that's it. This, this is all my questions answered. This is my new career. And I uh, went and studied in uh, Warwick, in the acupuncture college at Warwick. And the only reason I moved to Warwick was because that's where the acupuncture co uh, college was that my practitioner had studied at. He could have said I studied in New Zealand, I'd have gone. I was always going to go to the same place. Mm. Um, it just happened to be Warwick and I never left. Still here, which is a surprise to me. Wonderful. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, the how... I don't think I've shared this yet. On this, I, I've done a, an, an episode giving people an idea of what I'm about and why this came about. I don't know whether I went into detail with this story, but how I uh, came across Claire was um, I was working in a self-employed position at the time for, I didn't think it was a scam, but I think it, was, it certainly was a scam. But anyway, and there was various um, events that were happening where you'd go and get the information and all that sort of stuff. And this particular evening, I got a call from one of the sort of leaders and um, she said, oh, um, you know, I think it was down, Bristol was where I was traveling to. And uh, she says, you know, you're coming down to Bristol tomorrow. I was like, yeah. She goes, well, I've kind of said that you could take Brian. I'm like, who's Brian? And um, she says, well, he lives in, I think it was Kenilworth and he hasn't got a car. And I thought you wouldn't mind. I was like, Jesus Christ, could talk about taking liberties. Um, I've never met this bloke, you know. Anyway, so I was like, oh, right, fine, okay. So the next day I go and pick Brian up. And um, it was Brian, wasn't it? Yeah. It was Brian, And, uh, and uh, yeah, so we're, we're traveling down to Bristol together and he's talking the hind legs off a donkey. <laughs> and, um, and I think it, it was, I, I, don't, I can't remember if it was on the way there or on the way back, but he starts talking about this wonderful filly called Claire. And uh, I don't know whether he used the word Philly, but... Um, he would have done, because he yeah. just put, we'll put it into context, Brian was about 70 at the time, but very uh, sprightly, wasn't he? Yes. I mean, he looked more like a 50-year-old, but uh, had a motorbike and everything, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so and, and he was a lovely guy anyway, and he was telling me about this wonderful Claire, and he was telling me about acupuncture. And, it, and it's really weird, because I think I'd fleetingly been thinking about acupuncture anyway, because, as you know, my rose, uh, acne rosacea... Um, my spots were very bad at that point um, and I hate Western medicine so I was trying to figure out what I was going to do so my ears pricked up and he told me that you just just about to qualify or you just qualified and um, I said oh brilliant give me a number and I'll I'll try her out because uh, you were doing an introductory session and um, five sessions so that was it I called Claire we booked in and um, we did the five sessions and in that fifth session, when we'd finished, she says, right, my love, um, as she likes to say, she goes, I'm not interested, she, you, sorry, um, I'm not interested in treating symptoms. It's got to be mind, body, soul, spirit, the works. And she goes, and some people are going to cut and run at this point because they don't want to deal with stuff. And I'm looking at you and I'm like, it was, it was, but it was deep into my call. You know, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm not scared. Yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. Uh, and to put it into context, I've been married a year at this point. Um, and she just said, I have to tell you, you are deeply unhappy. And I just looked at you like, what? You know, I'd been married a year. I'd, I'd felt really content from being married. You know, that safety, that somebody actually wanted to sign the register to be with me for the rest of my life. You know, all of those sort of thoughts that you have. And I just looked at you and I was like, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm very happy. And you said, I just have to call it as I see it. 
and then it, that's when the sledgehammer, I've got the bumps again, um, that's when the sledgehammer came cracking over my skull. And um, yeah, I, I was just broken open and the tears just came, didn't they? And it was, that was the, the start of the rest of my life. You know, I was, that was 10 years ago. So I was 36, been married a year. Um, and I always knew deep down, I always knew deep down that I was holding things back and I was, you know, hiding a secret for a man I was still in love with that wasn't my husband. Um, and yeah, and, and the point of telling that story was the divine forces at play, Brian, who I'd never met in my life, and I was forced into taking to Bristol, <laughs> tells me about this wonderful filly called Claire. Um, at a time when I'd, I'd been thinking about trying to do something for my skin and it changed my life forever. So it, yeah, soul contract, we know anyway, but it yeah. was just, there are no such thing as coincidences. It is all orchestrated beautifully. So, and we either, we either choose to take that on or like you say, we choose to put the head back in the sand. Yeah. Yeah. So I, was, that's, I have a lovely memory of Brian. I don't know if he's still on the planet or not, or whether he's um, passed to a different realm, but, uh, what a lovely man. Just, he reminded me of a Peter Pan. Forever young. Forever yeah. young. Um, what a dear, dear soul. And what a lovely intermediary for you and I to, to meet up again. Yes. And, and there's a, there is always a sense, I think, of recognition at some level. You know, when we meet somebody at, at a do and we go, have we met before? And you know yeah, you yeah. haven't met before. It's the most ridiculous thing to say, isn't it? Because you're standing there going, I've never met you before, but you have to say it. And that's for me is when the soul recognises the soul, the soul family group member that you've incarnated with thousands of times over the eons. And here you are again in that perfect moment of synchronicity. And it's like, there's such a celebratory feel um, that you just think, hello, even though you don't know, you know, hello again, here we are doing our stuff. Yeah. And, it, and it just becomes a journey then, doesn't it? And then you become, you know, you're, you're walking side by side through life before you know it. And uh, it's such a blessing. It's such a blessing to, to be reunited with soul family group members like that. Absolutely. Yeah, and absolutely. I think for the purpose of, uh, of whoever's listening to this as well, you know, that that was the start of my unraveling I always call it yeah um 10 years ago and literally I've been telling Claire before we started to record this um a week ago um so I've been single for six years and uh a week ago a friend of 23 years who um we were in a band together and we still do music together every so often uh we decided that we liked each other more more than just friends and it's it's like so the reason for telling you this is like I was bereft and horrible 10 years ago and in a place where I thought I was in love with a guy who was so wrong for me um and was in denial Claire kept telling me no he's just the catalyst to get you out of your marriage I'm like no he's not he's the white knight that's gonna charge in and save me and you're like mm, no <laughs> Um, to you know fast forward 10 years and I've changed so much in that time as a result of all of that yeah. and as you said before we got on this podcast I'm you know my heart is open my energy is open and I'm so I'm just gonna say it fucking happy um, and like we you know and we, we've both been pinching ourselves mates for 23 years it's crazy but um, it's perfect and it's perfect timing so I wanted to throw that in there for any sort of, you know, person that might be in a similar situation to say, as bleak as it might look now, or it will be over the next, however long your wilderness is, um, the result and the reward at the end is more than you could have ever imagined. So, um, It's so true. Mm. And it, it very much reminds me of, of many conversations that I have with people about what if there's nothing better? You know, that terror, and it, it, you just know at that point, they're speaking from the, the human egoic self of fear. Why don't I stay with this? Because this is what I know, I can manage it. Um, but if I ditch this, what if there's nothing better? And the fear then just, you know, you can feel the contraction in the energy field. Mm. And, and, and then suddenly, you know, the potential, the, the any degree of optimism or hopefulness just 
that is extinguished in the moment through through a, a tsunami of fear. Um, and then I and then we just look at if if they want to, we'll go into a more philosophical conversation about well, let's look at joy. And I do believe that humans are hardwired for joy because it's the soul in the human form that is just the radiating frequency of joy. And we work very hard as humans to to <laughs> annihilate joy yeah. on a daily basis. You know, I know. give us a choice, and we'd you know we'd rather shoot somebody down off a pedestal that we've put them in than applaud them up there and say go for it, go for it. You know, we're there's a very odd part of human behavior that that almost feels we are unworthy of joy. Mm. And I think part of this outward bound, um, you know, you're going away from true self, soul self, just exploring what it's like to be human makes it a very, very challenging incarnation opportunity. And then we get to the point of joylessness. And I think we could all put a finger in a map of our timeline and say, where did I feel the most lack of joy? right there and that was the beginning of the turnaround and heading for home mm. because home is joy that's for me that's it's just so simple so if you're in a joyless situation yes it's familiar yes you've developed coping strategies yes your material needs might well be met you have a roof over your head there's a combined income you know you're not going to be evicted you're not going to be starving it's safe it's predictable it's a slow death, but it's, you know, but it's all of those things. We'll compromise to the hilt and we'll just stay there because the thought of not even having that is, is just too overwhelming. So we'll stay. But what I say, what I try to convey my belief is that if we're naturally hardwired for joy, surely the worst that can happen is that we'll feel the same lack of joy. That, that, that there cannot be a worse scenario than the one that we're in. So what is the risk of leaving that? Because if we, if we have the courage to take that leap of faith and to just say, oh, that's it, no more, I'm not settling, I'm going for this. The very worst thing that can happen is you'll get the same. Well, you know how to deal with that. You've got your strategies, You've been perfecting them over the last 35, 42 years. You know, no risk, no risk at all. You'll attract the same sort of bloke with the same sort of situation and you'll just, you know, sneak them on like a pair, pair of comfortable slippers and you'll go, oh, well, here I am again then. But there's no risk to it because you've reached the, the zenith of your lack of joy. So if we can just do it, the chances are on paper we're going to find a bit more joy. And if we're going to find a bit more joy, whatever that life looks like, and it might feel insecure, it might feel a bit chaotic, there might be concerns about the material security, but actually if we're feeling it, if we're feeling the joy, we'll be in a place where we can manage all of that stuff. Because the joyful vibration is a higher vibration. And when we're operating from a higher vibration, we're much more expansive, we're more open, we're more receptive, we're, we're mu a much more fertile ground on which things can grow, rather than the barren soil of where we've stayed for the la you know the rocky landscape, Martian landscape for the last forty odd years. Um, we're actually on a place of potential fertility. Why would we not go there? Mm -hmm. Worse, it can only ever be the same as what we've left. But actually, the chances are overwhelmingly, the odds are in our favor of finding a much more joyful life. So why would we not do that? And the, the two questions I invite people to ask of themselves when we're stuck in this endless cycle, you know, spin cycle. Well, if I did that, oh, I can't do that because that, 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 and that, you know, so then we come back to the beginning oh, I want to go, but if I go, I won't have this. Thing. Oh, we're back to the beginning. And I say, just ask yourself the two questions. How does it serve me to stay in this place of joylessness? Yeah. For what purpose would I choose to stay? Always reminding ourselves that we are always empowered. We have, you know, we are divine beings who can make choices in life. The perception of being a victim is purely that 
a victim, it's a choice. We can choose to be empowered or we can choose to be a victim. Nobody makes us do anything. Mm. That's my firm belief. So if we can step, take that first bold step and say, I take full responsibility for my life, my emotions, my thoughts and my behaviors. Okay, now we're starting to feel the power. Now we know we've got choice rather than being stuck in something where we feel without choice. I can't do that because if I leave, I'll have no income and I'll have to go and live on the street. Yeah, actually, if we use a little bit more creative thinking, that's highly unlikely to happen. Could do for some people, but maybe they need to go and experience life on the street to really find out what they what they value. Maybe they've been exploring extreme materialism and realized how empty and worthless their life was, even though they were surrounded by expensive things and huge houses and extensions and families here, you know, uh, holidays here, there and everywhere. Mm-hmm. Why were they still unhappy? And all of this stuff was around them. I thought this stuff was meant to make me happy. I remember as my marriage, very short marriage, um, was coming to an end, I'd I'd just got some money and um, I'd bought a Chesterfield sofa. I'd always, always wanted a brown leather Chesterfield sofa and it came to the marital home. My husband was away on detachment, both in the Air Force. And I sat on this sofa in our newly purchased mortgaged up to the Hilt house and, and I just thought, well, I should be feeling waves of joy. It's all come together. I have the handsome husband, fast jet navigator. I have the two German shepherds. I have the house and the Chesterfield. Oh, and the BMW soft top in the drive. Why do I feel so bloody sad? And it was a crushing moment because that was my first reappraisal of what does it mean to be happy? What does it take to be happy? And I realized that when you outsource happiness to the external environment, to things and other people, I'll only be happy when you say you love me. What's all that about? Mm -hmm. Uh, Then I realized in that crushing moment that actually happiness comes from within. And I realized what a deeply unhappy person I was. Mm -hmm. Everything I'd striven for was, was not the answer. Fortunately, the marriage ended very quickly after that. And, um, as it was always going to, God love him, love him dearly. Um, you know, onwards and upwards, onto the next, the next experiential chapter of our lives, which wasn't a complete um, replica of what had gone before, but it was quite similar. I literally sort of went from that which I knew well. I, I've moved the boundaries a little bit, but essentially I went back into it again, and it took me twelve years to get to the point forty-two. And I thought, it's not that. It really isn't that. Stop bashing your head against a brick wall, Claire. This is not it. This is not you. This is not where joy lives. And then, as I said to you, it took me three years to figure out where it might live and start that whole rebuilding. It's classically, you know, the tarot cards. It's the hangman. It's the hangman and the tower. Those are the two cards that I think we would all have in our deck in our spread when we get to that pivotal moment of we've gone so far we've explored to the nth degree what it's like to be human and only human and then we realize we've got to be more than this and then we ping back and start heading for home and at that moment it's the tower it's the tower and the hangman and it's it's bloody hard did you do the two you said there's two questions you ask your clients did you do yeah. the two questions uh, how does it serve you yeah And for what purpose would I? How does it serve me to stay in this situation? And for what purpose would I choose to stay in this situation? It's very difficult to tell yourself the big fat porkies that you've been perfecting for (laughs) 20 odd years, you know, the well-worn response. Well, because, and you look at yourself and you go, when you are, it's something strange about the energy of those questions. It's like you have to hold a magnifying glass to your soul if you if you can still find your soul i felt pretty soulless at that point but if you can find your soul and you hold your magnifying glass there's not a lot of wiggle room for excuses and habituated responses the old porky pies don't quite do it when you ask those questions not to the point where it's so compelling that you would stay yeah so often as not we don't ask the questions We'll just keep trotting out the usual answers. Of course I'm happy. Are you really? Of course I am. I'm married. I've got the BMW. I've got the two dogs. I've got the bloody Chesterfield. Sat in the bloody Chesterfield. 
I must be happy. You know, because it's quite a shocking thing to realise you're not. Yeah, it is. None yeah. of that, none of that is working for you when you've worked 17 years to get it. Yeah. You know, it's quite, it's quite tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. So I think, I think, um, well, that, well, that was perfect. You know, the, the two questions that people can actually sit now and ask themselves. Um, yeah. I, I think the biggest, well, for me anyway, and for lots of friends and people I know that the main reason you, sh you mentioned earlier about having shared, in you know, shared incomes and stuff um, for the household. That is, I think that is the main reason that keeps people stuck, especially women, because yeah. they're so scared that they're not going to be able to survive financially on their own. And I would throw it out to, to anyone listening. You know, I, I, when I left or when I told my husband I didn't love him anymore, I, I think I was working part time. And I was still trying to do stuff in my spare time, you know, to generate more income. And, and it was petrifying for me because I was like, how am I going to manage this house on my own? Um, but you get resourceful, you know, and like you said, you know, and, and in the end, I was like, well, <coughs> you know, it was mum's friend, Claire, who actually I bought my wedding dress from, another Claire. Um, and she kept saying to my mum, <coughs> we need somebody like Mel, where she was working at the time. And um, I was like, mm, no, no. And um, anyway, she must have done it about three or four times. And at that point, I think I was far enough into what am I going to do um, to take it seriously. And actually, that was a year of giving me a really decent salary for working part time and a real stepping stone to, to realizing how I could stay, you know, stay in this house. Yeah. Um, so, again, perfect timing and being open and receptive to these little nudges that uh, source, God, call it what you will, gives you um, rather than ignoring it. So I think, and, and it's also trust. Trust is huge and, and keeping the faith. You know, I've read loads of books, listened to loads of books about self-development and people's life stories. Um, and one particular comes to mind and, and she basically, she had an amazing job, very well paid. And she just kept getting this, you need to leave, you need to leave, you need to leave in her head. And, and she was the main breadwinner as well. And in the end, she, took, she, she just knew she had to act on that impulse. And she did. And she had nothing to go to. And her husband wasn't working. Three days later, she got a call out of the blue from Facebook. And they needed somebody with her skills. And, and um, uh, it was very specific. I can't It was something to do with religion and, and all that. It was very specific. And um, she didn't even know Facebook knew her. You know, and she just took that leap of faith and the, and the universe delivered. And I think that's what so many of us don't do because we're sh scared shitless. Yes. That we're going to not be able to pay the mortgage. We're going to get repossessed. You know, we're going to go bankrupt and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. that reality just doesn't really play out, not, you know, 80% of the time, 90% of the time. So, yeah, it's having that trust and belief in yourself, really, isn't it? Yeah. And, and energetically, it's extraordinary what that does. And you said, you know, as soon as you make the decision, the, what the, for me, the hardest thing is to actually come to the decision. Yeah. It may take a couple of years to unpick it, you know, and, and put yourself in a position where you can leave, walk, stay, buy somebody out, change your job, change your career, whatever. But actually, from the moment you make the decision, your energy field changes. Mm. And, and the resourcefulness, the resilience, that, that little inner voice that we can develop that heightened sense of in, intuition, the gut feel becomes louder because our energy field expands. Fear and need are the greatest contracting energies, uh, vibrant um, frequencies that do this to our energy field. And we don't see opportunities. There's no bloody opportunity when you're, you're frightened for your very survival. You know, all it is is hunker down, hang on tighter, control more, fear more um you know it, it it's so restrictive but the minute the decision is made privately to yourself is the only person you ever have to tell i'm going to do this it's time i'm you know i'm going to face the inevitable it's time to change suddenly literally in that moment energy fields open and as you said you 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 surprise yourself with your amount of resourcefulness yeah i i was getting a bit tight on money. I'd paid for my degree. It was a private um, college that I went to for acupuncture. And I chose not to get a career loan that you know you would never pay back. I, I chose, no, I've got, I've got some money from the Air Force. I'm going to pay for this up front. 
but it got a bit tight while I was doing my studies. So um, after when I graduated and I was building my practice, I thought I need some more income. So I got a lodger. Well, anybody that knows me would just be they'd pick them once they'd pick themselves up on the floor because I can't even say the word share. <laughs> you know, I can't share a book without putting my name on it and a sticker saying this belongs to Claire Taylor Powell. Please return by, you know, that the whole thing, I don't know what it is, it must be past life stuff, but it's very difficult for me to share anything. So how to, sh and as a Cancerian, sharing my space, my private space, and I'm quite a hermit person, but it was just unthinkable, but I thought, you know what, needs must, I thought I can do this. Yeah. And once yeah. I'd made the decision, and I had this lovely chap, huge bear of a man that worked for the NHS on contract doing data stuff. And he left the house at half past five, never hear, heard him go. He'd come back in at four. He'd have his shower, make his sandwiches and go and sit in his room for the rest of the night. Couldn't have been a more perfect lodger. Never saw him. Never saw him. He was a sweetheart and he loved dogs. So he looked after my little doggy. Um, thank you, God. You know, what a gift. Yeah. What a gift. But it's just amazing what we can turn our hands to, to what we can conceive as possible. Whereas before it was an absolutely, I'm, you know, that is a line in the sand. I'm never going to cross that, you know, over my dead body. And suddenly all of our never, 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 never know suddenly becomes mm, yeah. possible. It's extraordinary. It's yeah. extraordinary. And the life changes from that moment. Yeah. From that moment. Wonderful. Yeah. We are amazing beings, Mel. We're complex. You know, this whole walking hand in hand as a, as a divine soul of the highest vibration of light congealed into a rather clumsy you know human body of flesh and bone it's an extraordinary um extraordinary gift but an extraordinary challenge to hold the two in the same hand and i always see life as a coin and you've got the human being on the one side and you've got the soul on the other it's the same coin it just depends which side lands face up that moment as to how you're coming at life yeah um but you're holding the same coin all the time, the all of it, the entirety of it. And I feel with these extraordinary shifts, astrologically, we know we're coming into the age of Aquarius for the first time in God knows when. Um, there's an extraordinary opportunity here to literally walk the path of the divine illuminated soul in human form on earth and enjoy this amazing planet and actually learn to live in sympathy with it, in a supporting role with it as a custodian, um, we can make this shift. We yes, can absolutely yeah. make this shift as humanity um, if we if we are bold and courageous. Yeah. And we you know and we step away from well, I've always had that. I can't possibly give up this. I can't do without a car. I'll have a carpool. Oh my God, I'm not having a carpool. You know, I al I've always gone abroad for a year. I'm not going to give up my I'm not going to give up my overseas holiday for the sake of you know clean air. You know, if we can just let go of the of some of these things that we've thought were non-negotiable and just allowed our minds to be a little bit more receptive as to what we might consider doing, that's all we need to do. Just consider the possibility. Wonderful. So I, I think on that note, um, I'm going to bring this to a close. I've really enjoyed this because obviously it's been ages since we've seen each other anyway. No. Um, Bloody lockdown. I know, um, but yeah, dare if, it. How dare it. if, if um, anybody listening wants to get in touch with you, Claire, or find out more about what you're doing or the wonderful stuff that you do, how can they find you? Um, I'm on Facebook, Claire Taylor Powell. So I've just used my name. I don't have a business name. So Claire Taylor Powell, there aren't any others that I'm aware of. So that I'm on Facebook. Um, I've got a, a YouTube channel. Oh, that gets awkward, doesn't it? Because now that's just numbers and letters and, and just impossible to even pronounce so i think via facebook or um my email address is claire tp c l a i r t p no e claire tp at googlemail.com drop me a line Wonderful. drop me a line and um if people just want to talk about the possibility I'm always open to talking about the possibility so there's always an opportunity to chat with no obligation no fee just to get a sense of 
what their life might look like. And then if they want to do the work, and I, I'm sure you were mistaking me for somebody else, Mel. I can't imagine I would have said, I'm not prepared to work with anybody. He's not going to do the whole job. <laughs> I'm pretty sure oh, you yes, did. I, I know I did. I can hear myself. I'm slightly cringing because I think that sounds a bit creepy. <laughs> I'm, I'm not always that direct, but I know with you, Mel, you know, just when you recognize a soul and you know their capability with some intuitive knowing, there's no point messing around. You, you don't have to do the, the softy, softy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know I did. I, I was quite, I was very hard with you. Um, and you were very, very generous with me while I was learning my, learning my ropes, to be honest, because um, I was a bit clumsy in the early days. Not with my needles, I might add, but just <laughs> in terms of that whole managing the journey but thank you for staying with me and helping me i've learned as much from you um more from you than you will ever know so thank you but yeah you. if anybody just wants to chat i'm always here wonderful thank, well, thank you. you again claire i've loved it absolutely loved it me too wishing you well darling blessed be blessed be everybody yeah. go for it <laughs>